Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. I'm checking out a pretty powerful mini PC today that's not all that expensive, all things considered. This is the GMK Tech K8. It has a Ryzen 8845HS processor on board. It's actually halfway decent for gaming. And we're going to be taking a closer look at this mini PC in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that GMK Tech here sent this to the channel free of charge for my review. Got a couple of other ones from them coming up soon as well. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this mini PC is all about. Now, the price point on this should be around $649. And I say should be because on Amazon, this, like many PCs, shows up at a pretty high price, $849. But then they've got a coupon next to it that you can click on to get money off. And right now, that coupon is for $200. So be sure to check the coupon before you check out. Now, this, as I mentioned, has a Ryzen 8845HS processor. As you'll see in a few minutes, it is super fast. It also has 32 gigabytes of DDR5 5600 RAM on board, and you can max it out at 64 gigabytes. And of course, the RAM is in dual channel configuration. It also has a one terabyte NVMe SSD. A little bit earlier, I took off the top of the lid there. You can just snap it off, and then you can unscrew this other panel here. And then you get at the insides here where you've got that memory. It's nice to see they've got some crucial RAM in there, which is very nice. The one terabyte SSD is on the right. The Wi-Fi card is underneath it, but there's also room for a second NVMe SSD. So you do have some decent storage upgrade options on this. The build quality of the case is not spectacular. It's all plastic, but the performance, as you'll see in a few minutes, certainly makes up for it. So there are many PC brands that have better builds, but this one at least will uh, perform where it counts. Now, as far as ports are concerned, you do have a bunch of them on here. So you can see you've got your headphone microphone jack here. This is a USB 4 40 gigabit per second port. We will test to see if it truly is that fast in a minute. And this is, of course, full service. So you can do power in, video out, along with data devices, and it's compatible with Thunderbolt. I do recommend using their, their uh, included power supply here. This is a 120 watt power supply. You can get a maximum of 100 watts through the USB-C port here, but you may as well keep that port free and plug it in with the included power adapter. You got two USB 3 ports here. These look like uh, Gen 1 5 gigabit per second ports. Now on the back here, you've got even more ports to look at. Another USB 3 port. There's a USB 2 port above it. You have two ports here for video output, a display port and an HDMI, but you can also output video through that USB 4 port on the front. And you've got your dual 2.5 gigabit ethernet here on the back, and we'll test that ethernet speed out in a minute, and the power supply goes in there. And then of course, you've got room for cooling, all that goes on within this machine on the sides. Why don't we plug this in now and see how it performs? All right, everything has booted up here and we are running at 4K60 right now. And it does come with a fully activated version of Windows 11 Pro, although they're doing what a lot of other mini PC manufacturers do. And they kind of bring over this OEM license in a way that I'm not sure is legit or not. Because when you first go through the installation process for Windows, it doesn't take you through the procedure of connecting your Microsoft account to it. You can do that later, but typically properly licensed copies of Windows have you go through that process of getting your Microsoft account connected and going on from there. Here you set up a local account only when you first get it going. Now I did want to test the Ethernet first. Remember this has two 2.5 gigabit Ethernet adapters. They are Realtek. And I found a performance difference between the two of them. So here is the one that is on the left. And we're only getting about a gigabit or so downstream, which isn't bad, but you'll see in a minute the other one actually works better. Upstream is fine. And I occasionally see this on these Realtek adapters on my network here. Now, if I go into the uh, back of it here and just switch to the other Ethernet port, now we're going to be on the right-hand one that's closer to me. If I run this test again after we get on the network, uh, what we'll find is that the Ethernet actually performs better on the other port. So here you go. We're going to now uh, get our 
2.5 gigabit speeds that we would anticipate when we plug it into the other port. I'm not sure what's driving that, but this left-hand port doesn't seem to perform as well on the downstream as the right-hand one does. And these are some of the oddities that you encounter uh, with these mini PCs. So there you go. Maybe some drivers will correct that in the future, but right now it looks as though the downstream on the left-hand side port does not deliver the two and a half gigabits per second as advertised. Let's take a look now and see if this 40 gigabit per second port is indeed 40 gigabits. So this hard drive is one of my faster Thunderbolt drives. It's from Samsung. And if we jump over to my screen here, you can see that I have enabled better performance and write caching, which is something you have to do with these Thunderbolt drives on Windows to get the best performance out of them. And now what we're gonna do is start our Blackmagic disk speed test. And as you can see here, we're doing okay on writes, about 1.6 gigabytes per second but we should be doing about twice that. So although they're claiming this is a uh, 40 gigabit per second port, I'm not getting the speeds that we should be out of it. Certainly 1.6 gigabytes per second is not bad at all here, but this should be well over two gigabytes per second if this port was properly performing as a 40 gigabit one. So bear that in mind, your Thunderbolt devices will work but you're not gonna get the full bandwidth out of them here, at least in my testing. And that might be an issue for attaching external GPUs. So let's take a look now at some video editing. I've got DaVinci Resolve up here, and we're working with a 4K 60 frames per second video project. So far, everything seems to be pretty smooth on this. I did do some video transcoding on these clips to optimize them for editing, which I always do. And I found that the power consumption on the device under full load is just shy of 100 watts, about 97 watts or so. And as you can see here, that transition rendered here in real time without issue. I think if you are doing some basic video editing similar to what I do here on this channel, it should uh, be just fine for that. I'm actually very pleased with just how quick and snappy and responsive everything is. And this is of course due to that Ryzen processor, but also because we've got 32 gigabytes of RAM on board as well, so all in for basic video editing and other types of creative work. I think this is pretty capable and it should work pretty well for live streaming as well. So let's move on to some games now. This is Red Dead Redemption 2. We are running this at 1080p, pretty much at the lowest settings here. And as you can see, uh, we are in the near 50 frames per second territory. Typically it's running around 45 or so, but I rarely see this go below 40 even when you're in areas where there's a little more activity. So this really gives you a good feel for just how powerful these new AMD and Intel processors are with the onboard graphics. Everything is performing so much better than we saw just maybe a year or two ago, especially with more demanding games like this one. So it's feasible that you can run some AAA titles on these devices just at lower resolutions and frame rates, but still pretty impressive to get this kind of performance out of it. Some games like Starfield and others will struggle a bit more. You will see certainly lower resolution output on those, but the games are playable. And that's not something you could say about mini PCs at this price point not too long ago. Pretty cool stuff. Let's take a look at a few other things. Now this is No Man's Sky. We're running this at 1080p at the standard settings. So a little lower on the detail side. And we're doing about 60 to 70 frames per second. This game has a variable frame rate because the environments can change so dramatically from one world to the next and one scene to the next because you've got the planet here, we've got the spaceship we can climb into, we can fly to a different planet where there's a whole bunch of other uh, factors that come into play. So overall though, this game is playable at 1080p just like we saw with Red Dead Redemption 2. And we're gonna get great frame rates here, uh, sometimes above 60 frames per second as we're running around the universe here. So good stuff on the gaming performance side. But let's take a look now at game emulation with the Dolphin emulator. So here is one of the more challenging games to emulate on the Dolphin emulator. This is Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2. And as you can see here, it's playing at a pretty much full frame rate and it looks and plays great. It sounds good too if we have the sound on. So all in, 
I think you will have a decent emulation experience. I would say the GameCube and the PS2 and the Dreamcast and backwards should be uh, good to run on this device, and I did not see anything that concerned me here in its emulation performance. So if you were looking for something to uh, run a wide variety of games, you could plug this thing into your TV and have quite the emulation station here set up. So all in, uh, great gaming performance, whether it's modern games or older ones. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 3,167. And take a look at the Shuttle XPC that I looked at just a couple of years ago. It had a GTX 1060, and performance-wise, this mini PC with a single chip and far less power consumption is very close to what we saw out of that computer. It's pretty amazing. Uh, you can also see how this stacks up against a couple of laptops running with similar generation processors, both from AMD and from Intel. We also took a look at the 3D Mark stress test, and there we got a score of 99.7%. That indicates to me that the system under heavy load will not throttle significantly, so that's a good thing. The fan noise is pretty audible when it's running at full blast, but it's not obnoxiously loud, so you will hear it, but it's not going to overtake your environment. When you're sitting at the desktop idle or just doing some web browsing, you won't hear that fan at all. And sitting idle, the machine consumes about 10 watts of power or so, but of course that will vary when you start uh, doing different tasks on it. Now you'll notice I switched desktops here because now we are running Linux. This is the most recent version of Ubuntu, and everything came to life here very quickly, and all of the hardware was detected. That includes both Ethernet ports, the Wi-Fi, the audio, the Bluetooth, the video, so if you are looking to dual boot Linux or run it exclusively on here, I think the performance level will be pretty much the same as what you just saw on Windows. And of course, you can run all of this great free open source software. You can get your home lab going off of one of these things. Uh, these AMD chips also usually do pretty well for Plex serving too, although Intel mini PCs are what I still recommend because they are the most compatible. But if you are looking to run a small server, this will certainly do it for you. You've got plenty of fast RAM on board along with that Ryzen processor. So altogether, I have to say this is a decent machine from a performance standpoint, but like a lot of these lower priced computers, there are some compromises, namely the performance out of the USB 4 port. It was about half of what we thought it should be. They advertised 40 gigabits, we were getting about 20. And also that left-hand side Ethernet port is not running as fast as the right-hand side one is. So I think they might be sharing some bandwidth between some of these uh, devices on the internal PCI bus. So if you are doing a lot of input and output of hard drives and data, this is probably not the best choice. But if you're looking to do just work on it, like some video editing or games or whatever, I think this will do quite well and it's very competitively priced. As always, these are a buy at your own risk proposition. These companies are located overseas. They often don't have uh, any support in your home country. But if you're okay with that and you're looking to spend as little as possible, uh, this brand has been around for a while and they make decently performing mini PCs. That's going to do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Zybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Budley, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Steve Green, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.